Now this is part five of our lecture, and this is probably the most significant time period for locating Israel in the ancient world. It's the late Bronze Age. This is going to be the age of Israel, the exodus from Egypt, of Israel coming out and want the wilderness wanderings and ultimately coming into the Promised Land. So let's look and see how that interacts with what we know about the ancient Near East. Again, 1550 to 1200 is the late Bronze Age. And what we see in Mesopotamia is the initial rise of, it, of Assyria. So the Assyrians, these are the people that are going to live in the northern part of Mesopotamia. They become significant for the first time. But otherwise, Mesopotamia is relatively quiet. And, and there are people there. There's the, there's the Babylonians are there. The Assyrians are there. But essentially, the most significant actions and um, people groups are going to be shifted um, west to the Hittites and to the Egyptians. So when we look at Egypt, this the late Bronze Age Egypt, this is the New Kingdom Egypt. And this is where Egypt reaches its zenith in terms of power and prestige during the um, ancient world. This is the age of the Egyptian Empire. Up until this time, Egypt had essentially practiced a foreign policy of isolationism. But as we talked about in the last lecture, um, Egypt had been conquered by a foreign people, the Hyksos. Again, if you go back to our geogra geography lessons at the beginning of the semester, Egypt was essentially protected on all sides by geographic boundaries. They had deserts, they had water, they had a river with, that was impassable. So the invasion of the Hyksos really jarred the Egyptian psyche. And so the new kingdom begins with the expulsion of the Hyksos under the first, initial, under the first pharaohs of the new kingdom. But essentially, at this point, Egypt shifts to a foreign policy of never again. We're going to expand the borders of Egypt so that we have buffer zones that protect Egypt from ever being invaded from Syria, Palestine again. So the Egyptian pharaohs of the New Kingdom period take their armies and move them northeast up into Palestine. And in doing so, they come into conflict with the Hittites who are coming down from, again, what would be modern-day Turkey. So they're on a collision course. So essentially, the, the northeastern border of Egypt is going to be somewhere between um, the southern part of Palestine and up into Syria, depending on who was stronger, the Hittites or the Egyptians at the time. One of the most famous kings of late of New Kingdom Egypt was Amenhotep IV, also known as Akhenaten. He's significant not for his military exploits, but because he was also known as the heretic pharaoh. He's a pharaoh, he's the pharaoh that actually was a monotheist who shunned traditional Egyptian religion and in, in, in instead worshipped the Aten, or the solar disk. And there's always a question of whether he influenced the Israelites, or the Israelites influenced him, or neither. But Akhenaten is important also because he's going to move the capital city out to a place called Amarna. And this allows the um, collection of a bunch of documents. And we're going to see later that one of the great archaeological discoveries were the Amarna letters, A-M-A-R-N-A. -A. But Akhenaten was significant because he represents a monotheist back in the 14th century. <clears throat> His son's name was Tut Ankh Amun, King Tut. He had a short life in many ways that may have been a response to um, people that were unhappy with his father's foreign policy. Um, but uh, King Tut, most people know him because he, he, really, he was one of the few pharaohs whose burial site was left untouched. And so the vast riches of his were, were found, and many of you may have even seen them when they've toured the United States at different times. But anyway, the Exodus fits into the late Bronze period. But the question is exactly when it would have happened. Because the claim, the consistent claim of the Old Testament is that Israel's ancestors, should be ancestors, not descendants, were delivered from Egyptian bondage. That's the claim. That's the salvific claim of the Old Testament, that God delivered Israel's ancestors from Egyptian slavery. The problem is, how do you fit that in? Now, there's a couple different dates that people work with. And again, this is mostly an evangelical debate because in mainline his, um, scholarship, uh, most consider the exodus from Egypt to, not, to be a, a sort of a myth. But for those who argue for a historical exodus, there's a question whether it was an early date or a late date. The early date would be approximately 1440. 
That's based on the date from 1 Kings 6.1 where it says 480 years after Israel came out of Egypt, Solomon built a temple. That takes us back to about 1440 B.C. Um, in, in any case, there was a pharaoh with a long reign right around the time of the Exodus. So if this was an early date, the, king, the pharaoh's name would be Tutmosis III. The late date for the Exodus is the more common one that we see in movies like The Ten Commandments um, or The Prince of Egypt, the animated feature. And this um, pharaoh would have been Ramses II. So it's either Tutmosis III or Ramses II. And again, it comes down to some reconstruction. If you're interested in, in really digging into this, I invite you to take my Exod Jesus of Exodus class at some point, and we do spend some time looking at the historical background of this. But again, the, the key piece is the central claim of the scriptures is that Israel was delivered from Egypt, and it is possible to fit the events of the Bible into this late Bronze period. Now, this I want to talk about the most significant extra-biblical um, artifact that's been discovered. It's the Merneptah stele. Um, Merneptah was the pharaoh who followed Ramses II, and he's significant because he uh, created a monument to himself, and one of the last pieces of this monument has the first and earliest attestation of the existence of Israel outside of the Bible itself. And this is, and this is his claim. He cl Merneptah claims to have taken a, a, a military campaign, a victorious one, to Syria, Palestine, and listen to what he says. Desolation is for Tehenu, Hati is pacified, plundered is the Canaan, carried off is Ashkelon, seized upon is Gezer, Yenom is made as that which does not exist, Israel is laid waste, his seed is not, Huru has become a widow for Egypt, all lands together they are pacified. So Merneptah claims to have gone up and conquered um, these lands, these cities, and this people group, and notice the word Israel's there. Again, no matter what critics say about um, whether or not the Bible is true or false, here we have an, an, a, 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 an Egyptian pharaoh acknowledging the existence, existence of a people, and, it's, and this is tagged as a people in the hieroglyphics. It's a people group, not a place, calling themselves Israel in 1207 B.C. up in the region of Syria, Palestine, right where the Bible says they would have been. Here's another look at the Merneptah stele, and here it's trying to show this. Um, it's pointing to those that those are the hieroglyphics that say Israel there. All right, getting back to the late Bronze Age, uh, Syria, Palestine. The history of Syria, Palestine is essentially a cross uh, is that the region's caught in the crossfire between the Hittites and the Egyptians. So the different cities that existed there, depending on who was stronger, they would might be under the control of Egypt or might be under the control of the Hittites. One of the cities was called Ugarit. We've talked about it earlier. That was where the Baal epic was found, but Ugarit was a prominent port city up there in northern Syria during this time. The Amarna letters, these would be letters that were collected during the reign of, of um, Akhenaten, King Tut, and also Akhenaten's father. These are important because these documents, right from about the mid-14th century, give us a taste and a feel for what um, was going on in Palestine and in the ancient Near East during this time. They're written in, in Akkadian, but the language, the way the Akkad, the actual language that the Akkadian was 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 expressing, is very similar to Biblical Hebrew. And these, we have letters from places like Jerusalem, Bethel, Hebron, uh, and um, they give us a picture of the milieu, the, the political goings-on of what it would have been like right on the eve of Israel coming into the land, or if it's an early date, they give us a picture of what, the, what it was like really as Israel was coming into the land. So this is the time of the exodus and settlement. It's not easy to get dates and to correlate things because we don't know for sure when Israel comes into the, to the land, uh, but this would be the time when we, where we'd fit it in. And also the period of the judges occurs during this um, time as well. So let's give an overview. There's lots of dislocated people in the late Bronze Age. They called themselves Apiru or Habiru. The Amarna letters talk about these, these people. And essentially it was a term of derision that was used. You could be talking about mercenaries, um, people on the fringes. But essentially an Apiru was a person who didn't fit into um, the... T um, to the expectations of the people of the time, so these would be outsiders. And some try to argue that the, the word apiru is related to the word Hebrew. 
Um, it's a possibility. It's interesting. But what we would kind of say at least is um, not every apiru was a Hebrew, but probably every Hebrew person would have been called an apiru because, again, these would have been outsiders living in the hill country outside the edges of civilized society, if you will. And Ugar was very important for under, helping us to understand the religious milieu of the times in which Israel was coming into the land. Now, this whole, what's fascinating is at 1200, all the great kingdoms of the ancient world come to an, to, to an end. And in the literature from the ancient Near East, people are complaining about the, the arrival of the Sea Peoples. These are groups that come from the outside that arrive on the Mediterranean. And Egypt is attacked by the Sea Peoples. Um, the Hittites are destroyed by the Sea Peoples. The, the, Hittite, the, the Sea Peoples hit the cities of like Ugarit and along the coast. Mycenaean Greeks uh, civilization ends at this time. This is the time of the battle of the, of the Trojan War, of the Odyssey. So there's just a lot of upheaval. And it looks as though these Sea Peoples actually come and uh, move into the ancient Near East. Now, one group of Sea Peoples that's very interesting for the biblical record is Ramses III, um, this is an Egyptian pharaoh around 1177, records that he battled and repulsed a group calling themselves the Peleset. And he makes them live a little further up the coast. Now what's interesting is look at the word Peleset. This is the word that gives us the base word for Palestine, and this is also the group that in the Bible we call the Philistines. So Israel's principal enemy in the early part of the Iron Age, during the time of Samuel and David, the Philistines, this, this is actually a group of sea peoples that have come from somewhere else in the Aegean. And, uh, and what the sea peoples were able to be so successful militarily is because they bring iron with them, and they already have iron weapons, which gives them a military advantage over those persons living in um, Palestine already.